Hello, my name is Sam Feltham and welcome to Expert Interviews here on Smash the Fat. And in actual fact, it is the last Expert Interviews of the entire year. And I'm very, very pleased to have this chap on the show um, because ever since I met him about a year and a bit ago um, at the first ever Health Unplugged, um, and saw one of his talks there and then this year he smashed it again at Health Unplugged where he did an absolutely fantastic uh, presentation on, um, on insulin resistance and the whole picture of insulin resistance which coincidentally is what we're going to be chatting about today. Um, it's Dr. Tommy Wood. How's it going Tommy? Hi, it's going great. It's a, a real pleasure to join you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, absolutely, the pleasure is all ours, Tommy, believe me, mate. Um, so, um, before we get into what we're going to be talking about today, which is the whole picture of insulin resistance, um, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this crazy world of health, fitness and nutrition. Okay, so... I, I always open by saying that for, for the first two decades of my life, I mainly ate cookies and watched TV. Um, yeah. and, then, <laughs> yeah. and, and then um, the way I, I kind of started to get into this is before I went to university for my undergraduate degree, um, I kind of dove full bore. I, I threw my geeky tendencies into that kind of um, training and body image kind of thing you know read men's health went to the gym for two hours a day ate protein bars until they came out of my ears you know all that <laughs> stuff and yeah. and actually I, i'm certain you know a decade before it became you know cool i i had something board, bordering on orthorexia by the time i got to university wow. so in that kind of year i was you know nothing that i thought was unhealthy would go near my mouth or in my body um, and then I went, when, I, when I got to university, I started to row. So actually, you know, you're training 20, 20 hours a week and you have to start thinking more about performance, say, instead of just, you know, how you look or how you think you should look or something like that. Which is, and actually, just before you move on, what's your 2,000 meter time? Uh, my best was uh, 6.21. Oh man, that's amazing. 655 for me. That's still, hey. you know, under seven minutes. Under yeah, seven under minutes. Seven minutes is there, for hey. somebody who isn't who isn't a rower, under seven minutes is, yeah. is a great, great time. So well done. Um <laughs> uh yeah, so so then so then from there I kind of so my so my undergraduate degree was in biochemistry. And I kind of got into like training methods and you know, looked at CrossFit and, and stuff like that. And then I kind of took that, then I went to medical school afterwards. And I kind of started to do more coaching, so try and look at training methods and you know nutrition and try and improve performance there. Um, and then actually what happened towards the end of medical school, I, I started to uh, work with my stepfather and my stepbrother who has multiple sclerosis and, we, and they're both engineers. And we started to try and put together a big picture of what causes multiple sclerosis. And we used something called systems analysis, which is what you saw at my talk on insulin resistance, kind of a way to build a model of the big picture because I think often you know the big picture is very complicated and you need a kind of way to keep keep a, a hold of all the moving parts. So that's kind of what we did. And then that kind of brought me back into sort of the paleo sphere, paleo diet, autoimmune paleo diet, that kind of stuff for um, autoimmune disease. Um, and then uh, when I started my PhD after working for a doctor as a doctor, doctor for a couple of years, I just started to you know, spend I had access to journals, more time reading, blogging, started to do a podcast, go on other people's podcasts. And this is kind of where you find me now. So all of that together is kind of has kind of brought me to the point where I'm today. Fantastic. And you're based at the moment at University of Oslo? Re University of Oslo, yes. In yeah, that's right. And you're also the chief scientific officer for the Physicians and Ancestral Health Society. Yeah, so well. that's, yeah that's a group of group of doctors. Um, so after my first Health Unplugged appearance last year, uh, one of the members of this society, um, which is for, for mainly medical doctors, and, and most of them are based in the US, but with kind mm -hmm. of like an evolutionary health type bent, um, and a lot of them in the kind of very prolific in the low carb sphere, um, they kind of invited me to, to come to their meeting and I presented the work on multiple sclerosis and I basically talked biochemistry for a couple of days and then they asked, they asked <laughs> if I would, or somebody nominated me to a, 
chief scientific officer, which which was very very nice of them. And 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 then also since then, I've I've also I'm also chief medical officer of Nourish Balance Thrive, which is a functional medical clinic uh, medic in California actually. But all of the work is done online, so we work with people yeah. all around the world. Um, and people might have heard of Chris Kelly, who runs Nourish Balance Thrive. He also has an excellent podcast, and we do lots of. I bet he's a pro mountain biker, and I get to basically tinker with his diet and his biochemistry to see if I can make him go faster. So that's a lot. Awesome. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Um, and you also run um, Eat Better yep. podcast as well, along with Paleo Britain. Is yeah, so Chloe Archard from Paleo Britain. That's kind of something we, uh, we're we doing together. She's just had a baby. My PhD has kind of taken over my life. So it As comes in fits. It comes in fits and bursts, mm -hmm. um, and we uh, we're technically writing a book together. And I owe Chloe numerous apologies because I haven't held up my end of that bargain yet. But one day, one day, <laughs> one day, it's gonna it's gonna take take uh, strive. But um, also, people, um, if you're watching live, you can go to um, Tommy's website and blog, which is drragnar.com. So that's dr. R A G N A R dot com. You can also find him on Facebook at the same handle and on Twitter on the same handle as well. Um, and uh, is Ragnar your middle name? I yeah, Ragnar's my middle name. So I'm half yeah. Icelandic. Um, yes. So my, Viking, my Viking heritage come, coming That's through. That's right. There. And anybody that watches Vikings uh, will know, of course, Ragnar Lothbrook. Yeah, main um, character. Who, who, yeah, who is the, <laughs> the legend, the Scandinavian legend. Um, but uh, you might be named after. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, maybe. So it's my granddad's name, technically. Right. But obviously, before then, he was named. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, so um, let's get into the nuts and bolts about what we're talking about today, which is the whole picture of insulin resistance. Now, many people that are watching and listening to this very podcast at the moment um, will be very well aware about sugar and refined carbohydrates and their effect on insulin resistance. Um, but they're not the only things that are involved with this. Um, as you presented at Health Unplugged, it's a multifactorial metabolic condition that requires some system analysis, which is what you seem to be exceedingly good at. <laughs> um, so um, tell us first off, what exactly is insulin resistance? What's the main driver? And then what are the other things apart from those main drivers that we really need to think about? Okay. Uh, well, well, thanks. I, I have to say that in, in both of the, the diseases areas that I've worked using systems analysis, first multiple sclerosis and now insulin resistance, I've had chemical engineers do like, so I basically gather all the information and put together all the links, but I need somebody else to make the big picture because if I made the big picture, it would just be even more confusing. So I have to say that. So for the insulin resistance project, it was my girlfriend, Elizabeth, who's a professor of chemical engineering who did that. So I can't, I can't take all the credit. Yeah, um, sure. But so insulin resistance is basically um, the state where the cells in the body don't listen to the signal coming from insulin. And actually, I think one of the one of the reasons I kind of started to really dig into this is that people when people talk about insulin, they actually get the mechanisms of in insulin wrong. So they kind of talk about the fact that insulin is there to drive glucose into cells. And actually, most of glucose disposal by cells happens without insulin. Um, and so, so what's happening is basically when you're insulin resistant, a combination of things happen and the, the cell basically says, I can't, I can't take any more of this. I can't listen to this signal. I can't take any more essentially energy, be that coming from glucose or, or fatty acids. I can't take any more coming into the cell. I can't handle it because my, my metabolism is broken. Um, so, so please stop sending it. And unfortunately, usually, you know, it just keeps on, on coming, coming in. Um, and the reason why that happens, uh, so, so, so one of the main drivers is, or the main driver is absolutely the, the modern, the modern diet, we'll call it the modern diet. Um, and kind of what, what started to happen is, is people are giving this very simple view. And I understand why I give a simple view because, you know, people say carbs kill, carbs cause insulin resistance. And mm -hmm. in, in, in some respects that is absolutely true. And, and for people who, who just want simple actionable advice then the simplest thing you can do if you have insulin resistance is to reduce carbohydrate intake particularly processed carbohydrate intake but the, the thing is that it carbs don't cause insulin resistance by themselves they, they basically cause it in conjunction with fat um that, that's the main thing is combining the two 
um, you know, quite simplistically. And and I can kind of the way the way that the paleo diet has evolved kind of really perfectly exemplifies this. So when when they first described the the paleo diet in 1985, it was actually they described a very low fat because um, the meat was lean from wild animals and, and fairly high plants, you know, 65% of calories from plants. So fairly high carb, um, moderate protein, fairly low fat. And then, and then what happened is uh, we, we, we realized that fat soluble vitamins are very important, high quality dairy came back. Um, you know, we thought actually um, bacon is really nice, pork belly is really nice. Um, so, so, th so, so that was allowed to come back into the paleo diet. And then what happens is you've actually got carbohydrate and fat in that same kind of deadly combination. So then people who did well on the paleo diet initially brought back all the grass fed butter, put, you know, cover their sweet potato in it. And, you know, metabolically, that's the same as cheesecake. If you ask, like, that's what, mm -hmm. yeah. they're not that different. And, and then, so what happened, people was, you know, they, they stopped losing weight or they stopped, their health stopped improving and they actually started to gain weight again. So then what happened is people restricted carbohydrate to try and make up for that because they brought the fat back and then they had to remove the carbs. So you can kind of, um, you can kind of say that one or the other on its own isn't that big a deal, but as soon as they come together, then, then they cause a lot of problems. Um, but uh, there, were, there were a lot of things that or there are a lot of people who you know uh, we we're very um we really want to celebrate people who do well on a low carb diet you know you see all these success stories where somebody lost a huge amount of weight they got off all their type 2 diabetes medications you know this is or or you know they're treating something like cancer you know with some slight with some more you know ag aggressive therapy and you know it's mm -hmm. so so brilliant because it's hugely powerful but there's also a lot of people who just who struggle, you know, who who go on a low carb diet and they just don't see the results they expect, and that's sort of what really uh, drove me to dig into this. And and so what so what insulin resistance is, is is basically it's something you can measure which tells you that the metabolism of your cells just isn't working very well. Um, and this can come from um, a lot of other things, so oxidative stress, um, inflammation, and basically the the total amount of energy that's inside your cells. Those three things essentially can kind of kind of dictate how well your body is at listening to the, the message from insulin. And what what we've seen is that people who have maybe a gut infection or they have hemochromatosis or iron overload, or they have some kind of hormonal imbalance for whatever reason, um, or or for me, like I know that my blood sugar regulation goes off when, when I'm stressed and I'm not sleeping. Like it, I just goes even if even if my uh, is still still moving still trying to you know look after my diet like that just completely derails it so you know so many different things play in and you know people we we kind of this the simple message it really helps a lot of people but then a lot of people struggle and we need to be able what i always say is you need to be able to explain all the data like you need if, if carbs just if carbs cause obesity and you cut out the carbs and it doesn't reverse obesity then something else has to has, has to be going on and and it, it is explainable it's just a little bit more complicated unfortunately so um, yeah, it seems that carbohydrate restriction is the first thing to try, and yeah. if that doesn't work, then you need to kind of go um, into more detail about your your whole lifestyle in terms of sleep, stress, um, and kind of activity levels as well, um, because <clears throat> resistance training can have the most profound effect um, on increasing insulin sensitivity as well Absolutely. um now kind of before we get into those ins and outs um we did have an interesting question on the blog um from michael norris um about all of the stuff that's on nutritionfacts.org and for those that don't know about this um this website is run by um a vegan doctor called dr michael grieger um and he kind of basically says that low carb diets cause insulin resistance um, and that saturated fat raises blood sugar like anything else, you know. Um, so what, what are your take on that, on his information? So um, nutritionfacts.org often makes me a little bit angry um, because uh, he's very good at manipulating the data to, to fit his point of view. And as a sort of an aside, is, uh, Michael Grieger, I uh, recently did an interview with uh, Dr. Merkola, who I'm sure, or Mercola, who people would have heard of. And I, I think you should go and there's, there's a video and you should go and watch it because actually 
they're but like he's really sensible in that interview and actually i enjoyed mm. a lot of the stuff he says so it's very you know he does say some useful stuff before i like of course, <laughs> go of course. to the rest we of the end. <laughs> yeah occasionally we say some sensible stuff um but actually so you and i got a very similar question about these videos from a mutual friend um a couple of weeks ago and so basically what the videos talk about is the fact that fat accumulation in cells say in muscle cells impairs insulin sensitivity so basically if you if you're getting all these fats building up in in your muscle cells then your muscles aren't as good at metabolizing glucose um, or to responding to, to to insulin and that is you know absolutely true and one of the problems that i have with the videos is he talks about insulin resistance stopping glucose coming into cells and i kind of mentioned earlier that you know, actually, by the time you're using insulin to force extra glucose into cells, like you're already like it's game over. It's it, you're, you've got so much insulin in your system that every other function of insulin has just been knocked has just been knocked on its head essentially, because insulin isn't very good at putting glucose into cells. You need huge amounts of it. Um, so if you have type two diabetes, actually, you have more glucose going into cells. Like that's not the problem. It's the fact that you've got so much going in that your your cell just can't handle it. Um, and so you don't actually need insulin for that. But what's happening is that if you have a high insulin load um, along with a high fat load, then both, um, then what happens is both glucose and fat go into the cell at the same time. And basically the cell doesn't really know what to do with it. And, what, and you can get accumulation of these things called ceramides, uh, which are, are usually uh, a, a saturated fatty acid. So this is why he focuses on saturated fat because uh, palmitate, which is a saturated fatty acid, basically um, gets added to an amino acid serine and, and that sort of creates something called ceramides and, and they accumulate in the cell in the mitochondria and it causes mitochondrial dysfunction, which is kind of like at the center. If your mitochondria don't work, that's kind of at the mm -hmm. center of insulin resistance. The powerhouse of a cell, it, basically. Exactly, the powerhouse of the cell. And, and the mitochondria basically dictate what you use for fuel, how much fuel you need, and all the kind of the signals inside and outside the cell. So, you know, if, as soon as they start to fall apart, then, then you're really in trouble. Um, and so what happens is if you eat a large amount of carbohydrate plus a large amount of fat, adding the fat to the carbohydrate um, sort of causes you to release more insulin. So traditionally, we're always told, oh, if you have uh, fat with your carbs, it lowers the glycemic index, so your blood sugar spikes less, which is true, but it also slams up your insulin. And like I said, by the time your insulin is at those kind of levels, all the other things like the liver, um, other cells in the in the pancreas, you've already like completely obliterated them with with insulin, and then they start to turn off the signal because they're like, oh, there's so much I just can't listen to it. Um, but what's happening then is the very high insulin is forcing all this fat and glucose into the cell, and then they essentially have nowhere to go, and then these kind of dysfunctional fats accumulate. So he's absolutely right that if you have a very high fat diet in the context of continuing to eat lo lots of very processed carbohydrates or lots of carbohydrates so like the two combined then you do get mm. this fat accumulation in the cells but if you have just a, a low carbohydrate diet this doesn't happen now he does present some evidence which shows two days of a very low carbohydrate diet dramatically um, increases glucose levels in response to a glucose challenge so we talk about something called physiological insulin resistance which is basically um, if you don't eat carbs for a long period of time and you suddenly have a load of carbs, then your blood sugar basically shoots up because your body doesn't really know what to do with it. And, and we also talk about something like low carb flu or having to fat adapt or something like that. So basically what they've done is they've taken normal healthy people, they've just filled them with fat for two days, they haven't been able to adapt, and then you give them a, a huge sugar load and basically you're just causing confusion and you see that in a big spike in, in glucose. And, that, and that's conclusive evidence, right? So that, and that is, is, is that a low carb diet causes insulin resistance. Absolutely. It's two days, two and days. You're, you're going on I think with, with healthy people, did you say? Yeah, so I, mean, I think they were, they were stupid. So, yeah, but you're going on like two opposite ends of the metabolic um, processes that are going on within the body. And, you know, over two days, it's just not, and and actually what what they don't mention is that you see exactly the same thing in people who fasted for two days so basically right. what's happened is because your body has to maintain because it's still working on a, on a more carbohydrate based metabolism because that's what it's used to um it has to maintain um 
some level of insulin resistance so that you can maintain blood sugar levels in, in that short term period. You adapt and it doesn't right. become that much of a problem. Um, so even in the people who fasted for two, day, two days, they saw the same thing. But obviously, um, they didn't mention that because that just conveniently doesn't fit with his story, right? Because they didn't eat fat for two days and they still saw some degree of physiological insulin resistance. Um, so so it, it's definitely, it's, it's that kind of combined uh, carbs and fat in the diet um, plus and, and where your energy is not matching your output, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's, what that's what's causing the problem. So you can either um, remove fats from the diet, like he suggests, and he sees some, some great um, responses in his people, or you can you know, re reduce carbohydrates, especially if you're in the point where you've got some kind of metabolic problem. Uh, so you can go either way, um, whether what's most sustainable, yummiest, has the most you know, nutrient density and the most number of uh, micronutrients and vitamins and things that it all kind of differ depending on, on how that plays out. Absolutely. Um, and I think um, Jeff Folick did an interesting study probably about a year ago, maybe, maybe six months, I'm not sure, but where he did that sliding scale of where he had, you know, the same amount of saturated fat, but increased the carbohydrates over maybe 12 weeks or something. Yeah. Um, that was that was absolutely fascinating and kind of, you know, reflects kind of what you're saying there is that um, it's, it's all in the context of if you've got high saturated fat and high carbohydrate, then it's detrimental. But if you've got low carb and high saturated fat, it's not really a problem. Yeah, and so what, what they showed is that even though, um, you know, they, they gave these guys loads of saturated fat in, in the low carb, sort of ketogenic end of things, um, but the saturated fat in the blood didn't increase at all. So actually the saturated fat in the blood isn't really determined by um, saturated fat intake, which is kind of where that other aspect of saturated fat being bad where that argument starts to fall down um and and uh there's an there was another study done by uh Vorilek and finney a few years ago uh where they show that when people go on and it was a it was a calorie restricted um low carb diet but actually even though most of your calories are coming from fat the amount of fat in the blood after a meal actually falls so if we're worried about the amount of fat that's floating around, it's not necessarily to do with the amount of fat in the diet. You know, there's a huge sort of like metabolic adaptation to that and, and your body handles it much better and you don't get these huge sort of peaks of, of fat floating around. So um, so if, if people go on a low carb diet and adapt to it, then, then you know, those high fat intakes, you know, don't actually cause any problem at all along the lines that people are saying they might. It just doesn't happen. The evidence doesn't support that. There you go. Um, so going back to what we were talking about earlier, you've tried a low carb diet and you haven't lost weight. You've kind of stayed at the same um, and you're sticking to it 100 um, percent, which I've heard um, many people. And I've had clients that have uh, come across this issue as well. Um, so what, what are the next things to try for people? So I think uh, from there, people can sort of start by doing some some tinkering with their sort of with their meal timing or you know their meal composition so i, I think mm -hmm. it's it's very important if you look at again you know we go back to Volek and finney because these guys have, have you know really been at the forefront of this of this kind of research um if, if you're trying to lose weight on a low carbohydrate diet you do still have to get some kind of calorie restriction um, you, you do need to, you know, we talk about, you know, a calorie isn't a calorie. And, you know, for a lot of people, you know, calories don't count and, and diet quality makes a huge, huge difference. But in that, in that, um, in that scenario, you do have to, you, you do have to uh, generate some, some, a, a caloric deficit. And that's because sort of like the central regulator of the cell, something called, uh, in terms of energy requirements, something called AMPK, um, you need to basically activate that, which which says that you have some kind of uh, caloric deficit, and that does all kinds of brilliant things like improving um, metabolic efficiency, improving mit mitochondrial function, all that kind of stuff. So you do need some kind of deficit there. So if you are somebody who's you know putting a thousand calories of butter and coconut oil in your morning coffee, um, then you know, there's, there's definitely a case to, to moderate that down. So I, I'd look at total, um, total caloric intake it is important. Um, then also things like um, nutrient timing. And so people who 
um, are eating constantly, you can be keeping your insulin levels just high enough so you're not kind of bringing it down enough to stimulate fat loss. So, uh, you know, reduce meal frequency maybe um, to just two or three meals a day or shorten the, the, the period of time um, during the day. So, you know, we talk about eight, an eight hour feeding window or a six hour feeding window. Um, then there's also things like you could even go towards something like alternate day fasting or something like that because you just not, you basically just need to give your body a break and create a signal that um, that it's okay to start to start releasing fat stores. But mm-hmm. but along that along that side of things is that in order for that to really happen, you also have to have good health because uh, it's kind of like chronic uh, chronic stresses basically tell the body that you need to store calories for the future because. You know, you never know when you're going to eat again. That's essentially that's essentially what it thinks, right? Mm-hmm. So then that's when we come and in, come into the line of things like um, chronic infections, uh, particularly gut-related infections. So at Nourish Balance Thrive, you know, we see everybody who comes, you know, and it's it's lot, often people who, you know, they've done everything else. You know, they've done the low-carb diet, they've listened to all the podcasts, read all the blogs. You know, they probably know almost as much as we do at that point. You know, Probably they, more they, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, recently, Chris and I have done a lot on um, iron overload. And then some guys will go away and come, you know, read about iron overload, and they'll come back and they know more about it than we do, um, you know, which, which is great. Uh, but so people, you know, so these people are, are often down the sort of tried everything else. But then, you know, it's very, very common to see something like um, uh, some kind of dysbiosis, a parasite or you know, Klebsiella overgrowth or H. pylori or something in the gut that, that's kind of causing this chronic inflammation, which we know then signals back to to reduce um, cellular function and increase insulin resistance. So that's something that's very common. Um, you know, you can you can look at some of these things with just like some basic basic blood testing. So um, often people can go, you know, might be able to go to their GP. You do some basic, um, you know, even like basic lipid tests can can be really useful. So you can look at whether you still have some degree of insulin resistance by looking at things like your triglyceride to HDL ratio. Um, although the caveat of that is it only seems to work really in Caucasians. So people of um, mm-hmm. African or Asian descent, and I, it, it doesn't seem to work as much for them. But you can still look at the overall lipid panel. So if your LDL is very, very high, that suggests you might have some kind of inflammatory process going on in a number of people. Um, you can also get something like a CRP um, if you if you are particularly a male, middle aged, um, iron overload is very common. Um, the simplest thing to do is just go and give blood, but you can test it with with a basic iron panel, which your GP will probably do. Um, and then you can kind of get into more advanced stuff. So uh, we we do like a, a saliva test to look at hormone balance, and and now we've actually moved on to something called a Dutch test, which is a dried urine test for compre- comprehensive hormones. And what it does, it basically looks at all of your hormones and their breakdown products over the day. So you get this kind of nice picture because what you what you look at on a saliva test is just the total free hormone, which gives you a rough idea. But if, say, your cortisol is low, which is what we see in a lot of people, uh, particularly if they're chronically stressed, chronically inflamed, have some kind of chronic infection, we don't know if it's because they're not making enough cortisol or if they're breaking down all the cortisol that they make. And what we traditionally mm-hmm. thought was that actually this low cortisol because of adrenal fatigue, which may or may not exist and they're not making enough cortisol but what's actually happening in a lot of people is they're just breaking down that cortisol really rapidly because of that kind of chronic inflammatory process so you can look at all of that with those kind of tests but they obviously do um they i mean they do cost money and they're not something that you can get access to on the nhs unfortunately yet um so so i kind of i kind of start I'd, i'd start down that way you basically um look at your look at your um Meal timing, look at your meal frequency, look at your cal- caloric intake, also look at your micronutrient intake. So if you're not getting enough uh, potassium, magnesium, you know, those things are really, really important for proper cell function. And then, you know, you can do some, some really basic blood testing with your GP um, and, and then maybe some, some stool testing and some other hormone testing further down the line. You know, uh, things get more complicated as you kind of tick things off, but that's kind of the order that I do it in. And usually people will find something, you know, they'll, they'll realize that they're not sleeping properly or they're very stressed. Um, and they just need, you know, need to take a break or, you know, find some way to restore their circadian rhythms or get outside and increase their vitamin D and, you know, so actually the, the basics work for most people. Yeah. And then you kind of have, um, you know, unique situations where, you know, people have tried everything and then you kind of need to go into those kind of maybe slightly more expensive tests in terms of trying to find, um, the exact, 
um, thing that's going on. Um, yeah. Now, one thing that I kind of recommend for people is to is to try things as much as you can. Um, I mean, firstly, with a basic food diary, um, but then try try and start a, a sleep and stress diary as well, trying to track how much you've actually slept. Um, a Fitbit can be quite useful for that sort of thing because it kind of does it automatically. Um, and then stress levels as well, um, you know, just gauging it on a um, low, medium or high um, and just kind of doing that over four weeks just to kind of, you know, see if you are maybe more stressed because you kind of lose perspective when you're just living your life um, and because you're kind of making, you know, rash judgments on your own situation instead of, you know, kind of using the scientific method, which which is there to be used um, by tracking things and then, you know, the decisions out of your hand because you might think that you're kind of low stress life, but then if you track it for a month, then you find out, you know, half the time you're actually kind of medium to high stressed and it's like, okay, actually, it seems that I'm more stressed than I thought I might have been. Because um, I, I I can actually be um, a bit of a um, bit of a stickler for that because I generally think of myself as a laid back kind of guy and low stress and things like that. But you know now and again things kind of catch up with me, um, and it turns out okay I am actually stressed at the moment. I need to take a chill pill. Um, so trying to trying to do something like that is that something that you'd recommend? Yeah, ab- absolutely. I think um, if so so. The tracking stuff can, for some people, tracking things becomes an, a stressor in itself, and you obviously have Precisely. to. Precisely. You, <laughs> yeah. you have to know. You have to know yourself in, in that in that respect. That's but, right. but, def, but definitely, what happens is, or, or what tends to happen is, you know, you sleep a little bit li- less each day, and work is always crap, and you know, you always have to get up early to look after the kids, and and you know, and and then what happens is actually you're you think, oh, I feel all right. And so your normal actually isn't normal, and you kind of forget what it feels like to feel good and energized, and and that's kind of where you can maybe take some of those steps to just track things and actually sort of objectively look at stuff, and you know maybe objectively look at your sleep and things like that, and actually just remind yourself that there's there's a there's a you can feel much better, and there's a lot that you can do, but it, you know it, it, again it takes that kind of time and investment. But if people are looking for long term health. Um, then, then you know, I, I think it, it's absolutely worth it. So you have to know yourself, but maybe you need that kind of push to really realise that you're maybe not feeling quite as good as you thought you were. Yeah, and you need to kind of get on it, essentially, and yeah. start, you know, trying to sort it out. Um, now, one thing that you previously said there was about iron overload, and that's something that really interested me in your talk before, and you were talking about the easiest thing that you can do for that is to just give blood. Um, but if if somebody can't give blood, um, what else can they do? Yeah, so then uh, things do become uh, do become trickier. So if you have very high levels of hemoglobin or very high levels of iron in the blood, you actually won't be allowed to donate blood. But once mm-hmm. you're at that stage, then usually your doctor will prescribe you uh, phlebotomy. So they'll prescribe you to just go and see a a hematologist or a blood doctor and they'll just take some of your blood off. So that's if you've got very high levels. Um, other things, so if, if people then, for whatever reason, can't give blood, but they but they have something like a high ferritin level or they have other evidence of iron overload, then um, you can do stuff to reduce your iron, in, um, iron uptake into the body. So iron uptake is increased uh, with, uh, fruct- uh, with fructose intake. So obviously don't put sugar on your steak um, uh, or, you know, <laughs> what? I, I imagine, <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> I imagine, or, you know, well, I guess, I guess if you've got, you know, you've honey glazed your ham or something like that. Um, but so, so both fat and fructose particularly can increase, um, iron absorption. So then if you are going to have some red meat, maybe have it lean, uh, that might help. Uh, then there's, uh, lots of, so you can, uh, drink a glass of red wine. The tannins will, will bind to your iron. You can also um, drink tea and coffee, and those will, you know, I know some people with hemochromatosis who who manage it completely with diet, and they do things like drink tea and coffee when they eat red meat. Um, also, stuff like, I mean, I don't imagine many people are eating fortified grains, but, you know, basically anything with flour in it in the UK has to have, uh, with refined flour, has to have iron added, usually, so avoid products like that with added iron. 
Um, also, just try and avoid cooking in something like a cast iron pot, uh, particularly if you're, you know, if, so if you've got um, a, an acidic food in a cast iron pot, you're really going to start to release some of that iron. So don't cook your bone broth in a cast iron kettle with your apple cider vinegar um, and boil it for hours, you know, if you have iron overload. So, and, and then you can also take, so you can take something called inositol hexaphosphate, um, which is basically phytate. You know, we talk about phytates in plants and how they um, bind to minerals. So you can, some people take that. Some people also take something called lactoferrin um, that can bind some of the iron in the diet as well. So there's lots of things that you can kind of do to tinker with that if, if it's a problem and, and you can't donate blood. Fantastic. And, and people can find out more about that. Have you done a podcast on that yet? Yes, we did. So, I think on, you have. Yeah. Yeah, so, so most of the um, sort of technical podcasts mm. I've done recently have actually been on Chris's podcast. Um, so the Nourish Balance Thrive podcast. So we did one on iron overload. Um, and so, so people can hear more about it there. And there's also, I think Chris has written an article about it as well. Oh, and, and we went on the Ben Greenfield podcast recently. And we talked right. about it there as well. So, so people can hear about it. That's it. Like, proper technical details getting in there, fantastic. Yeah. Um, now, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today, but were there, were there any kind of other wise words that you wanted to impart on us about the whole picture of insulin resistance? Yeah, so so one thing that I'm really, I'm, I'm really a really big fan of, and, and you mentioned earlier, resistance training. And and I think that's, that's because muscle Muscle and muscle function, muscle strength, and just having some muscle is so so important to longevity. And I, and I talk about this all the time because you know people worry about heart attacks and, and cancer. But you know if you get to 80, 85, what is probably going to kill you is when you fall over and break a hip. Um, mm -hmm. And if you break a hip, um, actually you have a 50% chance of dying within a year. Um, and it's just so, so important that, you know, people are doing drastic weight loss measures, um, extended fasting, you know, there's a real risk, you know, when you lose fat, you also lose lean tissue. So, so when people are, are losing fat in order to, you know, both for longevity and for optimal insulin resistant or insulin sensitivity and, and metabolic health, you know, really, really try and get some resistance training and try and put on some of that muscle. Nobody needs to be a bodybuilder. Nobody mm -hmm. needs to be superhumanly strong or spend hours in the gym every day. But, you know, just kind of really working on getting your body moving and getting some of that basic strength back is just so, so important for long-term health. So that's kind of, that's one of my soapboxes that I like to get on because I, I, I've worked on an elderly care ward where, you know, these are the people that, that we looked after. And, and if people just had those sort of like, basic strength and ability to to look after themselves for as long as possible then that's really gonna um really gonna keep you alive for as long as possible as well so i think that's absolutely you, so you need to keep on squatting lunging yes. and press ups like if you just get those three done like then that's a good start ideally chuck in some chin ups there as well but you know <laughs> yeah so so what i say is if you can do a squat and a press up you can do a burpee and if you can do a burpee then you can get yourself off off the floor if you fall over and that you know might well save your life one day. So the, just exactly. those basic movements, like you say, completely agree. Fantastic, Tommy. Um, everybody at home, check out Dr. Tommy Wood's website, drragnar.com. That's D R R A G N A R dot com on Facebook at the same handle and Twitter as well. Check out his podcast too, which is uh, Eat Better Podcast. If you just uh, tap that into iTunes. It'll come up, and it's also on your blog and website, I believe, Tommy, as well, isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. And that only leaves us one more thing to do, and that's to hear a smash it out from Dr. Tommy Wood all the way over in Oslo. So on the count of three, Tommy, I want you to shout smash it out to the camera. So <laughs> one, two, three. Smash it out! <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for your time today, uh, Tommy. It's, it's been fantastic, mate, and uh, hopefully we'll get you on back next year as well. Great, yeah. Fantastic. See you, man. Bye.